Hi, my name is Dean and I serve as the lead pastor at Real Life Church and I want to take a moment before we jump into the message just to say thank you first of all for engaging with the message. We believe that this message is going to lift up your faith and lead you to encounter God through His Word. If you haven't already, we would love for you to take a second and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our online community is growing. This way, you can stay engaged and up to date on the latest messages, and this will help us to get the message of the gospel out to you and others. Again, thank you so much for joining us from Sacramento and beyond. We trust you'll be blessed by the message today. It is really awesome to be able to be with you guys. My name is Chris Songson. I am the founding pastor of South Hills Church, as Pastor Dean mentioned. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. And I'm also the uh, founder of Church Boom. We coach pastors and rescue churches. And part of your kingdom builders uh, uh, is going to be rescuing churches. And we're going to talk about that a little bit at the end. Uh, I have been married for 32 years. Yes. Well, to a beautiful Mexican woman. Oh, no, she's hot, and um, I call her my little hot tamale, and uh, <clears throat> she doesn't speak any English, but that's helped us get along. Um, no, I'm just joking. And, uh, and we have two amazing children, and then we have this third one. No, I'm, I'm totally playing. Um, and as of three and a half years ago, we became grandparents. <clears throat> oh, I'm telling you, it is the best thing on the planet. How many are grandparents here? Oh, isn't it the best thing in the world? Yes. It's God's gift to you for you not killing your own kid. That's really what it is. <laughs> I was holding my granddaughter recently, and my adult son says to me, Dad, it's like you love her more. I said, no, it's not like I do. I do. <laughs> you had a good run. It's over for you. It is the best thing on the planet. Absolutely love it. Well, hey, we're going to, uh, I want to minister to you for a few minutes and then turn the corner at the end, kind of let you know how many uh, churches across the nation are helping to rescue other churches. I'll tell you about that. But um, we're going to be going to, in just a moment, if you want to get there and get ready for it, we'll be going to John chapter 5 uh, in your Bible. John chapter 5, if you got a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, next time I'm at a hotel, get one. They're free. I steal them all the time, and I sell them on eBay. It's a side hustle. Um, but well, we're looking at John chapter 5 in just a moment. Quite a few years ago, I went to Costa Rica. I know that sounds like a vacation, but I actually went to <clears throat> I actually went to kind of the third world side of Costa Rica and we were doing some speaking and we were doing some conferences and all that me and a buddy of mine and uh, uh, we had this one day off uh, where it was like Tuesday we spoke at night and then we didn't have to speak again until Thursday. We had Wednesday off. And I went to the front of the hotel. Now I use that word hotel very loosely. Uh, it wasn't a very nice hotel, but I went up and I said, hey, I said, if you had um, a full day uh, tomorrow, what would you do? <clears throat> and the lady says to me, she goes, I would tell you to go zip lining and, uh, uh, in, in Costa Rica. We were in Costa Rica there. How many have ever been zip lining before? Anybody? A couple of you? There's a tree here and a tree like 80 yards away. They put a cable and you kind of, you know, you put a harness on, you clip on and you go across. They're gonna, they're, now they're saying to me, okay, hey, you should go zip lining. I said, okay, I'll go zip lining. That sounds great. So we sign up for the thing and pay the money, whatever. We get there at six in the morning in the lobby, and a, and a bus picks us up. It's a massive bus. See, 60 people, there's eight of us on there. And I don't know why, but whatever. And so we go up for two hours up to this Sarapiki River. It's where they filmed Jurassic Park. So we go up two hours, you know. Then we do an hour boat ride and then an hour horseback ride. That's how deep we are in the jungle. And in my mind, Pastor Dean, I'm thinking, they're going to kill us. <laughs> There's a whole scene right here, you know, from Criminal Minds or something. And so we go up there and then we get to the place and we're in the middle of the jungle and they give us the harness and he goes, okay, follow man. You follow this man right here. This guy, he's, gonna, he's our guide or whatever. I said, okay. So we're starting to follow him. I look over at the guy that was standing there that put the little harness on me and I said, hey, I go, you don't make us sign papers. And he goes, no. And I said, we don't sign anything? I go, aren't you nervous? I, and I go, what happens if we die? 
You know, like I'm thinking he's going to get sued. He goes, oh, you are Americans. He goes, if you die, we leave. And I said, that sounds good. Roll up the cable. Next. So now we're going to go zip lining. So you climb up this tree, and it all starts on these things, the tree, and then they have this little, like, four-foot platform that you can kind of walk around on the tree. There are parts in Costa Rica where there's ravines. So they have a tree here, a tree here, 60 stories down. You're going on one cable with one clip, 60 stories. And I'm like, this is a nightmare. And this is a third world, you know, kind of a third world area. So, you know, if you've ever done it here in America, it's a nice thick cable there. It's like dental floss. And... Um, and we're going down one after the other, and the, I'll never forget, I was like ride number eight or whatever, and I'm standing there, and you clip onto the tree, and you kind of hang there, 60 stories in the air, and the guy, and the guide looks really young, and I'm like, and other people are coming down, and so I finally asked the guide, who's in charge of our life, I said, hey man, I said, I, I said uh, how old are you? Because he looked really young, and he goes, 15? I go, what'd you say? And he goes, 17? Like that made it better. <laughs> oh, well now I feel safe. We ended up having a great time. We go back through all those, and then finally we get on the bus. The bus gets stuck and in, and, and, and in the mud because it rains 300 inches a year there, and it gets stuck in the mud, and it's spinning like that. We are literally pushing the bus. Mud's going on me. It was not in the brochure. And, um, and we're pushing this bus the entire time, you know, and trying to get it going. We couldn't get it going. Someone had to come and rescue us, and we're sitting there stuck in the mud. And as we're sitting there stuck in the mud, and I'm looking back on today's thoughts for you, is how often you and I get stuck in the mud. Now, here's where it is. Some of us come in today, and we're stuck in the mud. What does that mean? It means we're stuck in debt, and we haven't gotten out yet. We're stuck in anger over someone that hurt us 20 years ago, and we haven't gotten out yet. We're stuck in resentment, and we haven't got out. We're stuck in this place in life. We thought we would be farther along by the age we are now, but we're not farther along. And we feel stuck. And here's kind of the way that it looks. This is life before the wall. This is, uh, say life before the wall. Okay, this is life before the wall. Notice how happy he is. This is you. This is us. Life before the wall. You're making money. You're doing okay. Life's good. Nobody's hurting you. The, the Niners are winning. Everything is good. And then there's life in the wall. That's when the Niners lost the Super Bowl. Um, so there you are. Maybe you're in debt in the wall. Maybe you're in, in, sitting there in the wall. Life in the wall. So we have life before the wall, and then we have life in the wall. Life in the wall is, man, I'm bitter. I'm angry. Someone hurt me. I'm still resentful. Uh, I'm, I'm still in debt. I'm not far along in life that I thought we'd be. My, my relationship isn't going right, and I feel stuck in the wall, and I can't seem to get to the other side. Now, there's two choices once you're in the wall. Here's your two choices. You either stay in the wall. Now, stay with me on this. This is really good. You either stay in the wall, get to the other side of the wall, that's your only two choices because please understand, there's no such thing as life before the wall. Once you go into something, once you're dealing with something, it's not like, oh, I want to go back to the way it was. You can't. You either stay in the wall or you get to the other side of the wall, but there is no such thing as life before the wall. In John chapter 5, there's an amazing story of, of, of Jesus and how he uh, uh, comes into this area of Jerusalem and he goes over to this area uh, where they, it was a festival, so there's a lot of people there. And he comes in this area that they call the Pool of Beth Bethesda. The Pool of Bethesda or the Pool of Mercy. Now, here's the story. He walks into this area of Jerusalem. Pool of Bethesda is, actually means the Pool of Mercy. And there's this water over here. And there were porches that people would lay under, the sick would lay under the porch so they wouldn't get burnt by the sun because it's very hot there. And the angel would come and stir the water up, and if they could make it into the water, they would get healed. And so that's what they would do. Now, Jesus walks up to one guy that had been sick for a long time, and for some reason, it draws Jesus' attention, and that's where we pick up the story. It's in John chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda, which had five covered porches. Remember those porches, kind of like shade, they would lay there and wait to, for the water to be stirred. 
Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there has been sick for how long? Been sick for how long? 38 years. Okay, so now stop with me right there. You got five porches on the outside. You lay there in, out of the sun, and then you go and you make it. You get healed. If you don't, at the end of the day, you go back to your house. You come back, and you lay back under the porch. That's how it worked. And every day, you come back to the porch. Now, here's the thing. Jesus has this conversation with a guy that had been sick for 38 years. Eight years. Now, it doesn't say that he went out to the porch for 38 years, but let's say he did it for five years. Every day, 365 days a year for five or six or seven years, he would come out and he would lay there and never make it to the water. For whatever reason, he'd been sick for 38 years, although his healing was only a few feet away. But for some reason, he never was able to get there. Here's a thought process. His system isn't working. Whatever his system is, whatever his strategy is, it's not working, man. He'd been out there hundreds, if not thousands of times, and his, his system, his idea, his strategy wasn't working. I wonder sometimes if we get stuck inside of the wall for a week, a month, a year, a decade, has it occurred to us that the system isn't working? We're, whatever we're doing is still creating more debt. Whatever we're doing, we're not getting past the forgiveness. Whatever we're doing, we thought we'd be farther in life and we're not. Whatever it is, it isn't working. And here's the bottom line. You can't change your future until you disrupt your present. You can't change your future. Until you disrupt something in the press. Something's got to change here in the wall or otherwise you're never going to get to the other side of the wall. You have to, if you want to change your future, you have to disrupt your presence. I've written a bunch of books. No one ever reads them. But uh, they're great coasters if you want to buy one. Uh, and uh, I wrote a book a few years back called Quit Church. And the subtitle was, think about that word, Quit Church. Subtitle, because your life would be better if you did. Let me tell you something. When you're a pastor and you write a, a book called Quit Church Because Your Life Would Be Better If You Did, people have some really encouraging things to say to you. And, um, and, it was, and it's not about quitting church. It's about being stuck in the wall and not getting, you're just kind of going to church but not getting everything Jesus has for you. The whole idea is that if you'll let go of what's in your hands, he'll let go of what's in his that's the whole idea. If you go all in, he'll go all out. It's the whole idea of the book. So I write this book, and I've never in my life had a book do, I've written several books, uh, seven of them, and I've never had a book do this well. It went so well. It just took off. It was amazing. Uh, we were on doing TV shows and doing this, that, and the other thing, and uh, Fox News got a hold of it. We were on Fox News and Friends. It was like really cool, and, uh, uh, and it was amazing, and we did it on Fox News. They did an article, and I, I wrote the article for them, a 1,200-word article. It did so well. It was, it was number one on Reddit number one on uh, everything. It was above, we had in, when that article came out, in the first hour, we had 100,000 emails. 100, all of them just encouraging me. People just loving me. And, uh, and so it was amazing what God was doing. So in the middle of all that, I flew to Dallas to go speak somewhere and then be on this little TV show thing about the book. I get off of my uh, flight, I get onto the hotel shuttle, right? The book's kind of hot right there. It only lasts for like a month, and then it just goes, goes away. Literally, it does, like, woo! And, um, and so I'm sitting there on the shuttle, and I'm doing my, you know, going like this, and, and returning some emails about 10 o'clock at night, okay? I'm on the shuttle, okay? And I'm, it's like a little miniature bus, and there's a seat in front of me. And I'm going like this. And the people in front of me, these two ladies, they were talking, and I could tell they were Christian, Okay? But, you know, I'm just back there returning emails, sitting right behind them. All of a sudden, one of them says to the other one, hey, have you heard of this book? She said, what book? She goes, this one. She holds up her phone. She goes, this one. It's called Quit Church. I'm sitting right behind them. You can't write this stuff. <laughs> and then the other one goes, Quit Church? What kind of book is that? I don't know. Apparently, it's a Christian book. A Christian book? Who wrote it? It's a pastor, some pastor from California. And I quote, he's not a pastor, he's an idiot. <laughs> I'm sitting right behind them. The 
this is amazing. They get so worked out. They're like, yeah, that's the problem with America, you know, because anybody that says problem with America, they clearly have the answer. And, uh, and they're going back and forth. Yeah, yeah. They get so worked up. They literally, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they get worked up and they turn around and they invite me into the conversation. <laughs> they're so worked up over it. Although, literally, they turn this, can you believe this? And I acted like I didn't know what. I'm just back here fasting. Um, <laughs> And she goes, can you believe this? And I said, what? And she goes, this book. She holds it up, and there it is. And I go, what? What, what are you talking about? She goes, this book called Quit Church. She goes, all right. She goes off on it, and then she goes, and she tells me a couple bad things, and then she says, have you, uh, uh, have you ever heard of the book? And I said, I have heard of the book. <laughs> and she said, have you ever read it? And I said, I'll give you one better than that. I wrote it. It was awesome. The other lady's like, that's not true. She's Googling. I know what she's doing. She's looking for my picture. She takes the cell phone, puts it up next to my head so she could see, and she's like, Arr! and she freaks out. <laughs> and then, oh, here comes the apologies. Oh, we're so sorry. If we knew you were here, we wouldn't talk about you. I'm like, spoken like a true believer. <laughs> We'd have done it behind your back. So we get off the little shuttle, and we're in the lobby area yakking, you know, the back of the line talking, and they're like, oh, we really like the book. Can we get a picture with you? I'm like, no. And um, <laughs> the one lady goes on to tell me how bad her life has been. She tells me how many, uh, that she went through a divorce, that her husband had betrayed her, and I could just tell she was stuck in the middle of what? The wall. She was stuck in the wall. I gave my email. I said, hey, ma'am. I go, ma'am, I go, you're stuck in the wall. I go, if you read the book, you'll find out that you can get out to the other side of the wall. And uh, so we talked for a few minutes. I gave her my email. A year and a half later, she emails me out of nowhere. Do you remember me? I'm like, oh, I remember you. Um, <laughs> I've been talking about you since this whole story happened. Uh, and uh, she says, hey, she goes, I was wondering if you'd come speak to my leadership. I know you live in California, and, and my, uh, my office is an hour away. I'm like, what leadership? So we go back and forth. She went, watch this. She went and got counseling, went to Bible college for a year to get this like kind of ministerial degree in her denomination, and then she opened up a men's home that are uh, alcoholics and drug addiction and opened up a women's home for battered women, and she had leadership. And I went and I spoke to the leadership, and, I'm, and there was like 25 people. And I'm like talking to this leadership, do this little leadership lesson thing, teaching or whatever, and afterward I'm talking to her, and I said, what happened? And she smiled, she goes, I got to the other side of the wall. She decided that she was going to disrupt her present. You can't change your future and get outside of the wall until you disrupt your present. It's never going to happen. Now, let's go back to the story, okay? Jesus arrives on the scene. The guy's been laying there for years. He's sick. Okay, obviously his system isn't working. He's stuck in the middle of the wall. Let's pick it up where we left off, verse six. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked, would you like to get well? Six words, would you like to get well? Let's stop right there, leave that scripture there. Would you like to get well? Look at it, this is amazing. It is a yes or no question. Am I right? This is not a complicated question. Do you want to get well? Yes or no? That's it. It's very Now, Jesus' simple question isn't really what intrigues me. What intrigues me is the man's answer because the man's answer tells me why he was stuck in the middle of the wall. The man's answer tells me. Look at what it says. I, what's the second word? I, oh my, here, I didn't ask that. I asked, do, do you want to get well? His opening line, I can't. I can't, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Okay, next two words in white. Come on, out loud. Someone else always gets in the way, always gets there first. Oh, my gosh, doesn't that sound like us? Why are you in the wall? Well, it's someone else's fault. It's something else's fault. Let me tell you why my life is not where I thought it would be by this time. That's, it's someone else's fault. It's someone else's issue. See, here's the thing. 
This man couldn't, watch this, watch this. This man couldn't answer the yes or no question because of the story he kept telling himself day after day after day. It's someone else's fault that I'm stuck in this wall. It's not my fault. It's someone else's fault. He couldn't simply, and that's what we do. We look for a reason to push the responsibility off of us. We do that. Oh, I'm bitter. Let me tell you why I'm bitter. I'm angry. Let me tell you why I'm angry. I, I, I don't make as much money as I thought I would. But, and, and we go into these reasonings. Okay, I'm stuck in the wall because of my dad, because of my mom, because of how I grew up, because of the pain that I went through, because of the betrayal, because of the divorce, because of uh, I didn't get the same opportunities my, my friend did down the street. He got to go to college. I didn't get to go to college. Like, we have all these reasons, and I'm not saying they're not real And I'm not saying that they didn't hurt, because believe me, if we had time, I have my hurts. I got plenty of them. But I know this much, as it stands here in March of 2024, if I'm going to get out of the wall, I got to stop blaming everyone else. I got to get to the other side of the wall. And that's what this man was doing. Someone else. Jesus, do you want to get well or not? Someone else. (laughs) It ain't me. And we always find a reason. And I think we're pretty good at that. Here's the thing is I would encourage you to do, you gotta challenge the story you keep telling yourself. This man, someone else, yeah, but do you wanna get well? But it's someone else's fault. Challenge the story you're telling yourself. Is it real? Is it 100% real? Is it just, has it become a crutch? Have you started to believe some lies? Have you started to buy into some lies? Have, what has happened that's caused you to do that? And at some point, you're gonna have to take ownership. We don't like taking ownership. I don't think we do. I don't, at times. You know, I remember a while back, we, we, uh, I don't speak regularly at one of the campuses, but there were one of our larger campuses I was speaking regularly at for a few years there, and, and long story, but anyway, I was there, and it's a, it's a smaller town, but we have a ma- pretty big campus there, so we're pretty well known, you know, and so you kind of walk into a store and everybody knows you, and, you know, and so I go into the grocery store, my wife is like, okay, I need you to pick up these items, you know, and I go and pick up these items, and I go through the cashier, and uh, it's like $25.87. Uh, today, that would be an egg. Not a dozen, <laughs> just an egg. But a few years, you could actually, a few years ago, you could actually get a couple items, and so there's the few items, and they ring it up, and they're like, 25, 87, or whatever it came to. I'm like, okay, I pull out my card. She goes, the tap doesn't work, you gotta swipe it. I'm like, whatever, so I swipe the card. And then it says, declined. How many of you has ever happened to you before? Come on. And what do you say? I don't know why. I got plenty of money. I just looked at it yesterday. And the whole time, the lady behind the counter is like, okay, loser, out of the line, you know. You know what they're thinking. So I'm like, come on, man, I know I got money in there. I know I got money. She redoes it again. I talk her into it. Boom, I swipe it, declined. While this is happening, five people back. I mean, there's like a lot of people in line now. Five people back. Someone's, Pastor Chris, is that you? I'm like, no, it's his twin brother, Craig. And, uh, um... It's a scene, and a manager comes up, and everybody's there, and the manager, oh, sir, you got to get out of line. And I'm like, no, man. I said, she said, sir, you got to get out of line. I said, I said, I know it will work. I know it will work. Just do it one more time. And the manager's like, okay, one more time, and that's it. Like, it's a major. As he's retyping it and getting ready to do whatever he does, I look down and realize it wasn't my chase card that I was swiping. It was my Chevron card. So I'm down there, and then he goes, okay, go ahead, and I pull the chase card out. I swipe it. It says approved. And the man says, man, we are so sorry. And I said, I hope so. I have a reputation in this town. Now, I'd like to say I admitted it. I'm going to be straight up, Pastor Dean. I did not admit it. I walked out with them apologizing. Got a free egg. It was an amazing People don't like to, we don't like to admit when we're at fault. We don't like to admit that maybe we're the reason we're in the wall. Someone may have helped get us there, but at some point, at some point, man, you got to own it and just say, I got to get to the other side of the wall. I don't know why I'm here in the middle of the wall, but I want to get to the other side of the wall. Let's go back to the story. 
We'll pick it up in the last couple verses here. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Now this is the part that amazes me. Because he says, do you want to get well? Simple yes or no question. Well, it's always someone else's fault. And he goes into all these excuses and stories he's been telling himself for years. Jesus doesn't even acknowledge his excuses. Isn't that interesting? Well, he didn't go, well, I understand. You know, sometimes that happens. Let's Dr. Phil this. Um, no, no, no. He, said, he says, well, it's someone else's fault. And Jesus goes, and I, I'm going to kind of put a little sarcastic California tone into it. It's like, J just get up and walk, man. <laughs> would you just get out of the wall? <laughs> like, I know you got all your excuses, but you just get out of the wall. I think that Jesus loves you immensely. He loves me immensely. And if you're stuck in the wall, I think he would come and sit down, put his arm around you and just say, would you just stand up and walk and get out of the wall? It's there for you if you want it. Yeah. You just have to decide whether or not you want it. And he responded, got up, and he walked. Here's the thing I've learned that I think is a big idea from this story is that you don't always have the power to control, but you always have the power to surrender. You don't have the power to control, but you always have the power to surrender. I can't control everything that happened to you. I don't know why you got in the wall. I got reasons why I got in the wall. I can blame myself, I can blame other people, but one way or another, I'm here. I can't control everything. As a matter of fact, control is an illusion. I can't control it, but I can. I can always control whether or not I want to surrender. And that's what that man did. He was just like, all right, Jesus, I get up and I walk. And you got to decide, I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk. I don't know why you're stuck in the wall. I know that I've been there. I'm not as far along in life as I thought I would be. I didn't think that my wife would walk out. I didn't think that my husband would have an affair. I didn't think that we would have to be up. $40,000, $80,000, $100,000 in debt, but some way or another, I'm in the wall, and the system I'm using right now to get out of the wall isn't working. It wasn't working for that dude. Or maybe we just say, Jesus, I don't have the power to control, but I always have the power to surrender, and I'm gonna surrender to you, and God, here we go. I'm gonna get out of the wall. You see, here's the thing. Every day, remember those five porches they laid under, you know, stay out of the heat? And, and, and every day, when it didn't work, they would go back to their house, sleep, get up, come back, lay back under the porch. Every day, they would come back to the porch. I wanna challenge you today, Sunday of March in 2024, that you determine right now, I am never coming back to that porch. I am never going back to the way it was in my life. I'm getting out of the wall and I'm getting out of it permanently. And watch what Jesus does. Now, that's for all of us today. And I don't know where, why you're there, but I pray today you would decide to get to the other side of the wall. I pray that today that you would. I really do. Let's all get, we, I've been there. I've been there, man. I've been there with more pain than you could, I've been there. But we have to make a choice because there's no such thing as life before the wall anymore. Either you stay in it or you get to the other side. I mean, that's it. <laughs> I guess you can stay there if you'd like, but you can get to the other side. All of us, we could go around and we have reasons why we get stuck in the wall, but today we have to choose to get to the other side. Pastor Dean mentioned, and I want to turn the corner here, Pastor Dean mentioned that we do these things called coaching pastors and rescuing churches, and I want to take a few minutes just to tell you about why we're rescuing churches and what's going on there. Because we're all in the wall and we get in the wall, but we gotta get to the other side, the church is in the same boat. Let me show you life before the wall when it comes to the church. This is life before the wall, the church. Everything's happy. Now watch this, hold on, stay with me. Did you know that in the 1950s and in the 1960s, church growth was outpacing America population? What that means is more people were being saved than babies were being born. It was unreal. We were flying in the 1950s, 60s, even in the early 70s, it was just boom, it was just happening and God was, it was incredible what God was doing. But then, 
Man, in the last several years, actually at the turn of 2000 is when things just started going bad. Look at this real quick. The, yellow, the blue line, that represents the average per person in America's weekly attendance in church. The blue line's going down. The yellow line represents people that no longer go to church. That's all in the last 10 or 15 years. It's just going like this. It's radically changing. Okay, that's problem number one. Let me give you problem number two. Problem number two, we see that. Problem number two, Lifeway Research, one of the biggest research firms in America, between, watch this, between 6,000 to 10,000 churches in the U.S. are dying each year. That means, hang on folks, around 100 to 200 churches will close this week. I want you to let that sink in. Somewhere between 100 to 200 churches this morning are having their final service. They'll never meet again. That's what's happening. We are actually seeing in 2014, we shut down more churches in America than we opened, and the gap's getting wider. Right now, it's a two for one. For every 1,000 churches America opens, 2,000 will shut down. We're losing, folks, okay? And here's the next thing, is this one. New York Times says 46% of all pastors under the age 45 are considering quitting the ministry. 76%, uh, according to the market data re report, 76% of pastors admit to feeling inadequate for the job and need help. Folks, here's the thing. Attendance is going down, people not going to church is going up. America's closing more churches ever than in, in its history. And as a result, pastors are getting discouraged. They're, they feel like they don't know how to grow their church and they don't know what to do. We, we got together and we realized that man, something's gotta be done because the ultimate result is this. Now the church is stuck inside of the wall. We're stuck sometimes in the wall, the church is stuck in the wall. It is in a bad sense. How many used to say that America, have you ever said this before, some people that are maybe a little bit older, America's not the same place it was 20 years ago. How many admit America's not the same place it was 20 months ago? It's like common sense has become a superpower. Some of you will get that a little bit later. Um, I'm not getting all political, but it's just like, man, there's, there's been some struggles and let me tell you something, the more the lighthouses go out, the church, the more the lighthouses go out in America, the darker America gets. Never in our history of America has it been this bad and it's happening on our watch. Not on our great grandparents' watch, on our watch. And so I got together with a bunch of pastors in Dallas, Texas about three years ago and I said, guys, we gotta do something. I showed them all the stat. This is what's happening in America. This is all the churches that are being shut down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Went through all that. I go, guys, we gotta do something about it. And there was 15, 20 men, they're all mega church pastors, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna do it. You know, and everybody got excited. And then I said, I got this idea. What if we do a thing called church rescue? Kind of like bar rescue. I go, how many of you guys have ever seen bar rescue? None of them wanna raise their hand. I'm like, you liars. And uh, <laughs> they're all, oh, no, no, I was praying during that episode. Um, I see, ever see bar rescue where they go and they rescue the bar and they make it better? They do that with restaurant shows. What if we did that with churches? What if we, what if we went to pastors of churches that are 15, 20, 30, about to close the door and said, look, we'll give you free coaching for a year. You don't have to pay nothing. And then we're gonna help develop you and we're gonna give you resources just like we did a church in St. Louis just a few days ago, needed $10,000 because they're starting to grow but they're in the inner city. So we're like, we'll take care of it. Boom, we wrote a check for 10 grand. What if we started doing that? What if we started in the middle of that year of coaching them, started sending them away on soul care retreats, like to, to Nashville or to, to the Rocky Mountains, and we just paid for all of it, and everybody's in the room going, this is awesome, we love it, man, and, and we're gonna offer it for free, we're gonna rescue churches. One guy goes, how are we gonna pay for it? I'm like, I got no idea, but what a great idea. <laughs> and so we put together this rescue initiative and in the last two and a half years, we've been rescuing churches. And uh, we've been coaching churches, helping churches, rescue churches, and we are seeing pastors all across America that are joining us. One, financially, kind of like in the Kingdom Builders, like you guys are doing, which I'm so grateful for, but also pastors that are starting to coach as well. And man, it went from like, man, the first time we did it, it was like, the first, this is we're completing our third year, it's like, man, okay, first year, like, okay, 300. Then it went to 600. And this year we're on track for 1,000 that we will help rescue or resource. We're, ho we're hoping to do 1,000 churches. We just two weeks ago had 136 new churches come in and say, we gotta get rescued, man. And what we're doing, we're fighting it. We're saying we can't let this happen on our watch. And we have been 
fighting to get healthy again. And I'm not saying they're going to become mega churches. But man, I, uh, church Brian in, in, uh, uh, in Indiana, Joel in New Mexico, Alex in San Antonio, uh, Charles in, in Arizona, all these churches that were 10, 15, 20, or 30, Many of them are running 175 to 250 now. They're healthy, they're touching their cities, they're making a difference. One less lighthouse went out. We believe that rescued churches will rescue people. And I know this is a big statement, but we think rescued churches will rescue America. We can't let the lighthouses go out anymore. We gotta keep the lighthouse on. I love Convoy of Hope. I, I support, I, I, I speak for Convoy of Hope. I'm a rep for Convoy of Hope. I love feeding people, building water wells, but. America is the one that gives the money to all these things. We're the biggest country that gives money by far. They're not even a close second. If we lose the churches, what else do we lose? You can say goodbye to all that feeding. You can say goodbye to all that stuff. We got to rescue churches. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you a video in just a moment. We're going to show a video. Before that, I have one other thing I want to do. I'm going to show you a video of a church that got rescued in New Mexico. Then your pastor will come up afterwards. But I want to, if you have your phone, could you grab your phone? That's the thing you've been acting like you're taking notes on, but you're texting, that one. Um, (laughs) I want you to take a picture of this QR code right here. It's a free book we just came out with two months ago called uh, Reviving the Churches in America. And it's 11 stories, 11 different pastors that got rescued told their story in this book. Literally, they wrote the book. These are churches that got rescued. This is just my way in advance for free. Just put your name, your email, and then it'll just, it'll send you, uh, it'll digital, you'll get a digital copy of the book. This is just my way of saying from all of us across America that are rescuing churches, thank you, Real Life Church, for coming to the rescue. Thank you for giving to Kingdom Builders. I know you guys are in the middle of all that, but that part of it is gonna go to help rescue churches, and this is just a small gift to say thank you so much for coming to the rescue. Hey, once again, thank you for joining us. Real Life's church's mission is to engage real life, embrace real people, and encounter the real God. And we want you to know that you are a part of that mission. We also wanna make sure you know about the best way to keep in the know about everything that is happening at Real Life Church, and that's through our Church Center app. You can actually go and download it at the App Store, but through this app, you can give, check out all our small groups, look at our community events, and even update your personal information. We'd like also to take a moment and thank all our generous donors. Through your gifts, we are able to make a difference for God's kingdom in our community and around the world. There are a couple different ways you can give. You can give through the Church Center app, as I mentioned, via our website at rlcsac.com or text GIVE and the amount to 84321. Also, don't forget, again, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, RLCSAC TV, so you can stay up to date and encouraged with the latest message. We'd also love to connect with you on other social media channels where we share everything real life. See you next time. We are so grateful for your partnership. I want to show you this video. It's of Pastor Joel in New Mexico. Check out this video of the rescue churches, rescue people, and then your pastor will come. The story of this church and the way that it began is, uh, is one that was built off of failure. Uh, there was a church split and our church began. Uh, about 20 years later, the pastor of the church ended up in moral failure. Really, they ended up uh, uh, weathering some pretty tough years. And uh, at the end of that, uh, they'd gone back to about 60 or 70 uh, on a good weekend, and, and that was about the time that we came. Pastoring uh, before Church Boom came into our life was, uh, was scary. Uh, it was uh, very difficult. We had never been in this position before. And uh, as we came here, man, I, I wasn't really sure what to do. I wasn't sure how to make the dreams of my heart actually come to life uh, with what God had told us. As a pastor's wife, you do your best to support your husband. What was difficult was honestly to see him frustrated because he had vision, but he didn't have direction. He didn't know what questions he should be asking. I was 
an addict for years. I was at home and I was drinking and all the family was gone doing something. I was just sitting in my chair drinking whiskey by myself and we got a call that uh, my wife's mom got hit by a drunk driver. Um, woke up in the morning and that, that whiskey was still there and dumped it out. Um, and uh, get rid of it all, uh, started, started going to church. Growing up, I just had more of that religious background rather than the relationship with Christ. So then as time went on, I just kept thinking to myself, like, man, there has to be more to God than just this. Like, we can't live up to this. I got really sad and angry and um, bitter. And instead of like realizing what it was, I started taking it out on my husband. As time progressed, I started having an emotional affair with this man. And after I had a physical affair with him, I remember going into the bathroom and looking in the mirror and saying, who am I? Who is this? I have never felt the Holy Spirit in my entire life. And whenever I worshiped for the first time at Waymaker, he just overtook me. There was a sense of almost being rescued when Church Boom came because I didn't know what questions to ask. I didn't know what I should be looking for. And even in my coaching calls, I would tell Chris, I, I don't even know what I should be asking you right now. Would you help me? And I realized it wasn't until somebody with understanding came to help unlock the potential uh, through the coaching. That's really what, what set us on that course. hard to place a value on what we've received uh, through Church Boom, through the team at Church Boom, Pastor Chris himself. I'm also thankful that when they came in, the tools that uh, Church Boom brought, it wasn't to get us to become something other than ourselves. And there's so many amazing resources that, uh, that we're able to utilize. When I think of this church, I think of, I think of happiness. I think of a, a place where I'm safe, where my family's safe, Whenever I come to church now, I just feel so alive. Like, I look forward to it. I can't get enough of church. I need this place, and I couldn't do my life without Jesus and the people that are in this place. Amen. In 2017, Real Life Church was stuck. Uh, I had just laid off three pastoral staff, and uh, we weren't making it. And I went to our board, and I said, we've got to give. We've got to start being a tithing church. You see, I learned this principle. You'll never, have a harv- you'll never harvest a good life with your hands closed. And since 2017, the generosity that has been expressed through you has been incredible. Last year, 212 people gave to Kingdom Builders for a total of $115,000. And this year, I'm committed to do better than that because I believe we can. I'm I'm believing God for $150,000 this year for 14 projects, 14 different projects. You've seen three of them so far this month. Uh, There's several on the screen. I think we have a slide. I won't take time to read them all. Uh, Just a couple of things. Uh, If you're a guest, I'm just gonna tell you this. We're family. We don't expect anything from you in the way of giving. I know some of you guys are checking us out. Keep checking us out. I just want you to know that this is real. This is a value that we highly carry here uh, at Real Life. Uh, For those of you uh, 
uh, that call this your home. You guys know what we're about. And uh, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to start collecting pledges. We've already had several come in. You can do that uh, one of two ways. You can scan the QR code. Uh, if you guys could put that on there, the QR code there. You can make your pledge digitally. You can keep track of it uh, through the church app. Or you can get out this envelope that says invest in eternity. Maybe you've been praying for the last couple of weeks what the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit is laying on your heart to give. This is a pledge. Everybody say a pledge. It's not a bill. All right. I'm not coming after you saying, hey, what was that, you know, that you pledged? It's none of that. This is between you and the Lord. And so if you'd like to do that today, um, whether that's through a digital form or you want to fill one of these out and drop it in, our ushers will have some buckets uh, on the way out. Um, and again, next week we will uh, do this again. But can we just thank God for Church Boom and Pastor Chris for what they're doing? So appreciative of what God is doing in them and through them. And we're going to actually partner with him. He tells me to save at least three churches uh, with the amount that we're going to uh, commit to them. And so what was exciting was, you guys know we launched Pastor Damien uh, back in August. Amy and I were able to go there a few weeks ago. Uh, they've already went from 80 people to now over 400 people. <laughs> Amen. And then... I didn't share this yet, but um, we tithed off the profit of the building that we sold, uh, the artisan, and we were able to send Pastor Damien $10,000 to help with roof repairs. So how many know it's good not to have a leaky church, all right? <clears throat> Will you stand with me? Because I want to ask our prayer ministers to come. Because I know, listen that God wants to help us get unstuck. How many know he's been speaking to us over the last several weeks? And listen, I, I don't care what area it is in your life. Maybe you feel like you're stuck financially. Maybe you still like, feel like you're stuck relationally. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in your relationship with God. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in your career. Listen, how many know God wants to get you unstuck? God wants to get you free. So I'm gonna ask you, if you'd like prayer in any area of your life. Our prayer ministers are here. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. They'll be here at the end of the service. But church, we love you. We praise you. We're here. We praise the Lord, but we praise the Lord for you, but we're here to pray with you. All right? All right? You guys good? Let me pray. Father, I just thank you for this word, and I thank you for challenging us. Lord, that we would not have an excuse to stay in the wall, but Lord, God, we would take that step on the other side of the wall. And God, we would never look back. Let us be a church, God, that never looks back. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Hey, just want to tell you a couple of more things. Uh, for those of you that are in the, uh, the Secret Sisters there is a gift area out there, and we are overflowing. So if you were a part of that, check that out. A great networking going on there. Pick up your gift or drop off your gift. You could do that. That's in this area where all the T-shirts are. Uh, also, we have the Love Natomas Outreach Community. We're looking for some people for our next event coming up here in uh, a few weeks. We'd love for you to be a part of that. And then the marriage retreat. Uh, Sign-ups are actually out there as well. Church, I love you. If you need prayer, please come. Um, Amen? Let me pray. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name, God, that you are speaking to us about getting unstuck. Help us, Lord. Give us the strength in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen.